There it is. All right, welcome back to Get Straight To It. Facebook, we live here with Johnny Martinez himself on the side. Let me just make sure it's on the page, bro, and then we can get straight to it. Let's see. Hasn't told me that I'm live on here yet. Sometimes has a small delay. And we are live. Oh. All right, there we are. So, man, great to have you on the podcast, bro. Amen, um, amen. We'll open up in prayer right quick. So, Father God, we come to you right now, Lord. We give you thanks for this divine appointment you have set aside for me and Johnny, Lord, to, the, to have the opportunity to not only hear his testimony, but be able to share with the world, Father God, and those that may be going through the same thing, Lord. We ask that you open the ears and hearts of those that need to receive this, Father God. And for those that may be struggling in the same situations that they see, that you can do it for them also like you've done it for brother Johnny right here, Father God. And we thank you, Lord. We ask that we decrease as you increase in us, Lord. And we thank you for this time that you have set aside for us. We come against any work of the, the enemy right now that's trying to come and cause division and distraction against this podcast. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We glorify your holy and mighty name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, bro. With that being said, man, we can get straight to it, man. If you want to introduce yourself to the people, we dive to, into your testimony and anywhere in between. If the Holy Spirit leads, I'll, I'll kind of ask a question. But from then, you can just share your testimony for now. Yeah. What's up, y'all? Like you said, my name is Johnny Martinez. Glory to God. Um, I'm 25 years old. You know, growing up um, in Miami, um, Miami-Dade, South Florida, Homestead, Florida. Um I grew up as an only child. My mom had me when she was 13 years old, and um, my dad was not really in the picture due to um, some altercations through selling drugs and going to prison and doing a lot of time in prison growing up. So my mother grew up as a, um, a single mother. Well, my mother had me, and she was a single mother raising me, and, you know, I had a stepdad that, that was actually in, in my life, um, not in wedlock. You know, I didn't grow up in a Christian household. I grew up in um, project housing, section eight communities, low income. So, you know, I grew up with a statistic on my life that I was um, gonna be like everyone else that comes out of those communities. You know, we see dope dealers coming out of communities, gang bangers and stuff like that. So um, just growing up, you know, um, I went to a lot of different schools. I was always moving, you know, um, my mom was always on drugs. I never really knew, but she was always on drugs. And, um, you know, like, my stepdad was a gangbanger and, you know, so just seeing that, seeing, having that household of like domestic violence, you know what I'm saying? And um, just like, you know, crookedness. Well, my mom never liked to shed that light on me. So I didn't, I didn't really see a lot that was going on. I just kind of knew through growing up. And um, I went to like three different elementary schools. I went to two different junior highs and like three different um high schools. So, you know, growing up, um, around like eight, seven, eight years old, we moved to um, Winslow, Arizona, a little town in Arizona to go be with my grandma. You know, we were always with my grandma. My grandma ended up moving when I was really young. And, um, you know, being an only child, I would always like be like the class clown, you know, like always the one getting in trouble, you know, like always the one trying to make friends, very like social, you know, like always, always, always like talking a lot, stuff like that in school and getting in trouble. And then my grandmother, she was a foster mother out in Arizona. So she would get a lot of kids in and out, a lot of different families and stuff like that. And it was really dope to um to have that like piece of like family. You know, we didn't grow up in Christ. We didn't pray for our food. We didn't go to church. None of that. Like it was like Catholic church, like every five years, once every five years, like on some like, you know, like right. kind of like, you know, religious, like cultural, like family stuff. Right. Um. So there was this one family in particular that I got close to. It was two women, two girls and a, and a boy. And we got really close. And then, you know, they ended up leaving. But um, five years down the line, I'm like, <clears throat> a um, I'm in junior high. I'm playing football, getting A's and B's, you know, hanging out, like stuff like that. Like, I never wanted to be like my dad. So like growing up, like I was always like, like in my mind like so hurt by like my dad not being in my life I was like you know what if I ever have a kid I'm gonna be like 
exactly not like what my dad was in my life. Like I wanted to be there for my kid. Like in the beginning, like I wanted to make that commitment, like even before ever having a kid, because it affected me so much. Right. And so, um, you know, unintentionally, like the, these football students that I would go play football with, they would um they would come around during lunch and ask if like if I if I could get a hold of these certain pills, these painkillers. And um, at first I was like, nah. And then I started thinking because they would always come around and be like, you know what? My mom, gets, my grandma gets a lot of pills prescribed. Yeah. And so like I found out that they they get the same ones that they wanted. And then so I started taking them from my grandma and giving them to them to get some money and also like help my friends, you know, but I don't want to be I didn't want to be like anything like a drug dealer or anything like that. But unintentionally, that's basically what I was starting to do. And then so like, um you know, in the midst of that, like, this girl that was out of that family in that foster care, she came back into town, and she was friends with one of my close friends, so we all hung out, we all kicked it, you know, we all rekindled a, that friendship that we had, and it's like, we kind of picked up where we start, left off, and, you know, we're all grown up and stuff, so, you know, we started, like, the little puppy love, talking on the phone, you know, walking each other home, like, you know what I'm saying, like, after hanging out, and having long talks and stuff, and, you know, the little kiss and whatever. And then, so, like, there was just, like, basically, like, this little puppy love that was kindling, and we would always be on the phone and always hanging out. And then one day she had to go out of town to go um, stay with her dad. That was in, like, Utah. It was really close to Arizona. Yeah. And, um, you know, I could kind of see that she didn't really want to go. And, like, obviously, like, I didn't want her to go. But, you know, it is what it is. So we just kept on talking on the house phone, like, late night phone calls, like, always on, talking, talking, like, as much as we could on the house phone, right? Because, you know, it's only at home. And then one day before um, Valentine's Day, oh, so when we had hung out again, like, she she was, like, she found out that I was t- selling those pills to some of the football students. And then um, what ended up happening is that she, I ended up, she ended up wanting some of those pills and then I tried them with her. And then after that, like, I didn't really like them. You know, I was into football. Like I wasn't into like drugs and stuff. I didn't want to be like my dad, right. all these things. So what ended up eventually happening is that as we're talking and stuff, she moves out of town. She was about to come back around Valentine's day. And um, the day before her, her brother came and was like, Hey, like, Oh, she's coming back. Da, da, da. And like, like, apparently like, my mom already knew she was coming, so it was supposed to be a surprise. And the next day, as I get home from school, excited to see her, I get a call from her her same brother that was there, and she he's telling me that she's gone, and I'm like, "What do you mean she's gone?" And then he's like, "Well, she like she's gone. She killed herself." And then oh, wow. so for me, I didn't believe in God. I didn't know God. Like the little bit of God that I did know is because like I went to church camp one time with my grandmother's foster care kids so I instantly blame God right right I blame God for something that like wasn't his fault because I didn't know who he was I just knew he I felt like he allowed it and so that that developed into a very very um strong hate for God and then that hate developed into like just demonic like I was just operating in the demonic because when you hate the things of god that are pure holy just righteous loving and compassionate like you just naturally like cling to the things that are not of god right. and so growing up like i would tell kids like as a very young um teenager in junior high i would tell kids like out of ignorance like oh like while your family's like just random kids i'm just walking by like a household and i see kids outside and i tell them to come here and i'm like when your family's sleeping, like burn down your house or like go kill yourself and stuff like that, right? Like real demonic. And um, it just developed into like a very strong hate. I started slandering women, bashing women. Like it just developed more and more. And I'm popping these pills to numb my pain. The same pills that I had access to to numb my pain and remember, not only remember her, but to truly like just numb my pain from whatever was going on. And I, I, I grow this super bad tolerance like I'm 13 years old popping like 10 lower tabs at a time and like yeah and like building this crazy addiction that I didn't even know like I'm just trying to get lost I stopped caring about my craze stopped playing ball like you know like I just wanted to die low-key and I didn't I didn't have the courage to kill myself so I was just like riding like a like a like a demon or something right 
And so like, I just, as I'm growing and progressing by sophomore year, like I'm starting to go to parties, you know, like I was already lit what a fr- as a freshman, cause you know, we didn't have no Christ standard in my household. As a freshman, I was living with a senior going to school and living with a senior girl. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, so like, it's like, you know, I was growing up really, really fast. Yeah, you were pro- and then, progressing pretty quick. Yeah, and I started going to like parties and, you know, even starting to hit it licks, starting to rob people, starting to sell weed, starting to sell pills. And then it just progressed, bro. My tolerance got so high on the pills that I was also so dependent on them. I always wanted to take the pills. I didn't feel the same if I didn't have them. If I was hanging out with a female, like I had to be like off the perks and off the oxys, you know. And and then so one day I didn't have them. And so like my my core group didn't know I was popping pills like that. But there was these friends that I, that I had met and they would smoke heroin. And they offered me it one time and I was like, nah, like, that's some junky crackhead stuff. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not going to do that. Like, don't ever disrespect me like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, And like, but literally, you know, it's the same thing. Like, literally, literally, it's an opiate. You know what I'm saying? It's the same category. It's just like, you know, like, um, there's certain, um, there's certain things that they prescribe you in therapy that are perks that are like Adderall. And it's the same as meth. It's literally the same. They're the same exact thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, like, shortly after they offered me that, there was a time where I was going to go hang out with somebody and I really was sick. Like, I didn't, like, when you didn't have these pills, like, you get sick. Withdrawal, you know yeah. I mean? like, Killer. Yeah. And so, like, I, want, I not only wanted to hang out with them, but I wanted to be high and I wanted to be well. Right. As long as I was well. I didn't even have to be high, but, like, I wanted to. And boom, I went to these people and they, sure enough, like the way the double works, they handed me a tray of aluminum foil, black tar heroin. And I go to my, I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? And they're like, you smoke it. You get a straw. Da, da, da. And I'm like, oh. And I go and I'm like, I set the whole thing up. I like, I go in my closet and like, I hit it. And it was like a nasty, like taste, a nasty, like a nasty smell, like very like, like nasty smell. And and then, like, I remember the high just hit me, and I was like, oh, shoot, like, this is, like, although all these components are nasty, this is the exact high that I'm looking for. Right, right. And it was, it was like, like, pretty much that you were, didn't know that you were graduating or needed that <laughs> step up, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. but this is what you've been, because your body grew accustomed to already what you were, what you were feeding it. Yeah, bro, and so, then, boom, like, that was a whole nother lifestyle. Mind you, at this time, like, I'm low key like super demonic. Like I, I claimed atheist. I claimed antichrist. Not that I was antichrist, the antichrist, but that I was against Christ. Like that was a whole mindset in my mind. Like if you brought up Jesus, I call him like the f word. I call him gay. Like it was just stupid. Like demonic, yeah. right? Like I was just yeah. I was just lost, bro. And like I was so ignorant to Satan's devices, and then so progressing. Like you starting to use heroin. I started to notice I was losing myself and then I ended up wanting to escape that and I went to go meet my dad getting out of prison that wasn't what I thought it was gonna be you know what I'm saying like so I got I withdrew from that situation and I started staying with my cousin got kicked out of my cousins I started staying with my stepbrothers that I grew up with and um then I went like I was in the city right I was in this was back in Miami right and I'm in the city and I'm looking for like perks or something right like I wanted to get high and then they led me to the dope hole, bro. And they sold me some Zans. I didn't want Zans. I ain't no refunds in the hood. So, you know what I'm saying? So right, I, right. I, they, they, t- they was yeah. like, I ain't got I ain't got what you're looking for, but I could give you um, I could give you two rocks. And I'm like, rocks. And then they, they had me two crack rocks. And I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this? And then they're like, boom, like, I got a bando. You go in there, there's a, there's a stem, a crack pipe. And you just, you know what I'm saying? Like, and so I get in there and I hit it. And it was like, my mind was, like introduced to this whole new lifestyle and then like i get lost in that my mom like a huge testimony how my mom comes and finds me in those streets and gets a marchman act which is a mandatory rehab like it's like a little bit like an act you know what i'm saying like kind of like an arrest warrant and then from there like i go back to phoenix but by this time my tolerance is so crazy that when i get back like um i was i was there was one time I was sick and I was in this um this dope house that I have found. I found heroin before and while we're in there, they're all passing around a meth pipe and I'm sick and they didn't have no dope that I wanted. And right. then I remember they offered, they was like, you want to hit this? And I was like, in that moment, I remember reflecting on that moment like it was yesterday. I'm like, dang, bro, this is a whole nother, like, you know what I'm saying? Like another, like, you feel what I'm saying? 
And so I hit it, boom, and like I'm up for days, like alert, like I can't, I'm still kind of sick, but I can't really think about it too much because like I'm on this whole other high, like my my jaw is locked, you know what I'm saying? I'm focusing on this one thing for like hours, like just doing stuff like super jittery, like a lot of energy. And then like, it's like this whole cycle where nothing's comparing to the crack high, right? Because that's such an intense, you know what I'm saying? That like I start speedballing and doing heroin and math, shooting up, hallucinating, being up for four or five days without eating, bro. And like, there was even times where I get strung out in the streets and be out all night with knives in my hand, thinking like there's demons following me and like thinking everybody's against me, you know, like, and it just progressed, right? Like yeah. because I could sit here and go into deep, but it led me to like, bro, mental facilities. It led me to over a year in county jail time. It led me to Santaria witchcraft, you know what I'm saying? It led me to all these outlets and things that I was so lost and blinded by the enemy. And I started getting locked up, bro. Like, I started, like, doing a lot of time. And my mom, she had an encounter with God because she came from 20 years of addiction. She surrendered her life, repented, got baptized, started following the Lord. And she was giving me the word of the Lord that the Lord was giving to her that I would be delivered. She was praying and fasting for me. Come on, man. And then um, every time I get locked up, she'd be like, there was a time she'd be, she, I call her, uh, I'm in the, um, the book and cell, and she's like, oh my God, like I've been fasting for you for like three days. And I'm, she's like, I'm so glad, cause I wouldn't call her. I'd be out like, you know what I'm saying? Like doing my thing. And I'm like, what the heck? Like you are celebrating me getting locked up. You know, I didn't get it. My carnal, <laughs> my carnal mind was like not getting it. Right. Like, cause yeah. I knew my calling. Cause I had already like in the midst of my addiction, trying to experience God, but basically technically black backslid as soon as I came to God and got baptized. And so, you know, from there, like, it was just, it was just my process, bro, where God was showing my mom that I would be delivered, right? And she was telling me, and in my mind, I'm like, it's never going to happen. Like, I'm always going to be small. I had my medical marijuana card. I was getting Zans, lean, prescribed in my name. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, I felt like I could crush whenever I wanted to. You know what I'm saying? I could do whatever I wanted legal. But, you know, God had other plans, but I remember giving up in my mind and thinking, like, I'm going to die like this. I'm never going to have a kid. I'm never going to have family. I'm never going to have a career. And it's surrendering, right? Like, saying, like, that's my fate. Like, I'm riding with it. Like, to the wheels fall off, you know? And, right. like, God had different plans, bro, because I tell you, I was on my way to probation, checking in probation. I get locked up on my way to do prison time with stacked charges, burglary charges, mm -hmm. dope charges, everything, bro. And, I remember crying out to God with some dope in my shoe that they would have found and it would have been over. I already violated and scouted probation. Like it was over with, like I was going to prison and God supernaturally spared me from that prison time, bro. And it's been completely four, oh, almost over four years that I've been completely set free from all substances. Oh. Like God, God even sent me free from cigarettes, you know, and he's constantly been doing the work in my life and, um, yeah, bro, like, I've been on the radio, I travel doing ministry, I got my own little brand, I got my own little business, you know, and um, more importantly, like, I'm living for the gospel's sake, bro, and it's just the glory and the grace of God that somebody so far from God that never knew him, that I could call out to him, and that his grace and mercy could come upon me, right? and, you know, set not only set me free, but now he uses it for his glory, bro, and it's just a testament of, like, nobody's too far gone, bro, because I go to the same streets of overtime, you know, I go to the same streets to do outreach and feed the same people I was out there with, to minister to them, love on them. You know, I go into the prisons now, I go on the radios, you know, I go into rehab, juvenile, detention centers, all this stuff. And I'm able to proclaim the goodness and the mercy of God that nobody can look at me through a similar situation that I went through and tell me that there's no way out because I'm standing in their face, letting them know that Christ is that way. You know, and it's just all glory to God, bro. So when at this time we're going, I'm gonna rewind it just a little bit. At this time, yeah. when you started to spiral, right? You said you started to spiral because of the loss of that girl you had, right? That's what that's what took you to this peak. How were you able, when coming to Christ, with this question, coming to Christ, how were you able to forgive yourself for letting yourself go that far? It was a process, bro. I never <coughs> ever thought. I never thought I'd have to forgive myself. That didn't even make sense to me, let alone forgiving somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Let right. alone the forgiveness of God. But no, it was it's definitely a part of the process of sanctification, bro. Because 
I don't forgive myself into heaven. Only Christ can. But I definitely have, there's a portion of forgiving yourself for allowing yourself to fall into sin. Right. And, and doing yourself wrong, because let's be real. Like we don't let others down when we, when we, when we backslide and go into our sin, we let ourselves down as well. And so it was definitely a part of forgiving myself for not only spiraling, but the things that I allowed myself to do to my family, my loved ones, strangers, you know what I'm saying? Like all these kind of things that kind of haunt you, you know, and it definitely a portion of, of sanctification and deliverance to not only forgive others, but yourself. Now, with, with you saying that, you said that you, it led you into Santa Maria, it led you into a whole lot of other things. So your deliverance level, uh, as far as when you came surrendered, you know, I'm going to dive into something that I usually wait to the end of the podcast, but I'm going to go ahead and dive into it now because that just sprung to me. But your spiritual warfare, how hard was your fight to actually be free? You know what I'm saying? Because you have dibbled and dabbled in, into certain things and there is things that quote unquote claim legal right over you. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. you got to renounce that. You got to speak mm-hmm. against all of that. So how was that process? So when I actually, you know, I was never into like the witchcraft and stuff. Like I experienced it through a, through a family member. And um, when I had already did it, I was already like backsliding from baptism and like, you know, wanting to surrender, but not being able to. So I felt like I was already sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. because a, I didn't go along with it. B, it like, believe it or not, it's a long story, but the ritual like kind of backfired on them because I was already inhabited with the spirit. And when you do that, a spirit is supposed to, the the God that you get assigned to is supposed to come in. Right. So through that, when I called out to Christ in, in the jail cell, it was like, I remember specifically, I said like, Lord, if it's you, I'll go to prison. I'll change my life. And I'll serve you because I can't do this on my own. But if you can take this from me, but either way, I'm going to live for you. And he just so happened to be merciful to the point where he did spare me. So from there is when, like, I chose to surrender to him due to what he revealed to me. Right. And then the minute that he revealed that to me and the minute I made that decision to surrender to him, I believe that was my point of deliverance. Now, There are different kinds of looking like deliverance, right? Like if you have an evil spirit that you've allowed to inhabit within your body, then there, 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 there there has to be following deliverance sessions and stuff. But for me, from the drugs and from my influences, it was like God delivered me and met me right there in the jail cell, bro. And so afterwards, there is definitely spiritual warfare through my mind and through fighting in the spirit. But I think every believer has to go through that. And it's a fight that you have to do, you have to put on your whole armor, you know what I'm saying, you have to be e- equipping yourself to fight the good fight, you know what I'm saying, so right. I think that that's what's really important. Come on, man, and you said that during, during this process that when you did go through what you were going through, and out on the streets, you were going on binges for, you know, days at a time, you know what I'm saying, mm-hmm. like you missing in action, but these same places that you were going to, the same jailhouses you were in now call you to go and minister the gospel to people in there right i seen something that you shared before oh yeah bro yeah so i was in overtown you know i don't know if you ever watched the first 48 where they be like it's a real tv show about like real cases like it's real you know they got them in chicago miami well overtown is one of the one of the more heavy um you know crime activities I got to go into that same police department that I was booked in. So like, that's really big for me. You know, like I used to run from the police, like me and the police didn't get along, like helicopter chase, um, a batteries assault on police, you know, assault on officer and pepper spray by police, you know, like, you know, I mean, anybody that did crime knows how the police treat you. So to go in there and not only share my testimony, but to speak life into them and to understanding that police can be a form of God using them in people's lives. Let's be real, like there's crooked cops, but there's also a way that God can use your rest to get your attention to focus on him. Let's be real, like I had my conversion in jail and it went through. I started Bible study in jail, praying circles in jail, all this, learning the word in jail. So Paul in prison wrote half of the, the epistles, you know what I'm saying? So there's definitely a use for what God can use a police officer. So being able to go into these police office, I went to like, 
two two different um police stations in Miami to edify and encourage of my testimony. It's a blessing, bro. Like I would never think I'd be standing in front of a police precinct roll call. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like crazy, bro. And it's it's how God took the bad that you went through. Now you're an overcomer. You're gonna come back, and He sent you back into the same place that He pulled yeah. you from. You know what exactly. I'm saying? To, and and that's speaks volumes in itself. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people feel when they're delivered for something, you won't have to return to that. But at times there are select few that get called to go back into that. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? To bring them back out of. When did you know that it was that it was your calling to go back into those areas? You know what I'm saying? Because I know a lot of people who refrain from like, man, I'm not going there. I'm not ready for that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Did Johnny know that he was ready to to be able to be strong enough to go into that situation because you know what doors it can open going into situations like that. To be honest, like I said, like God started working, showing me ministry, like what it looks like in jail. Yeah. So like I'm in jail amongst, I don't know if y'all know, but like jails know like you just sitting down on the mat all day. Like there's like certain rules and codes in jail. That you, just got, you can't just walk like this you know what i'm saying like you gotta be like on point and there is temptation there is trials there is confrontations there are fights there are like a lot of like he said po politics and everything and and um and, you know and so like being in that starting the ministry in that and then going straight from that like my mom's already walking a year with the lord so i i went straight into like um preaching and street evangelism and rehabs so just that's just, it was just a rolling ball that i knew like when you know you're delivered obviously you want to be wise and use the sermon you're not going to go hang out with the same dope boys that you used to sling and do dope with but there is a form where god truly sets you free and releases you and gives you peace on going to certain areas and places to proclaim the gospel not to compromise come on man and that's yeah. and that compromise is a big word because a lot of people don't know how to separate the two yeah when when was it that you decided oh man i'm fixing to come out with the redeemed clothing line it was a design well yeah i never knew it was going to be clothing brand it was the design the first design i ever that god ever gave me was um the dare you remember dare yeah to do drugs and the tiger right that's what you're talking about yeah so he gave <laughs> me pray just like there it was pray you know the dr the, the red letters it was pray mm -hmm. and the pray is an acronym it's praise repent ask and yield that's what it yeah. boils down and there's an acronym as well yeah and then and you know i just remixed that and put it on a shirt and in the back i put the acronym in scriptures and it and honestly did very well and i was like oh shoot this is crazy and then yeah like I don't know, this, the name Redeem Supply just kind of came to me. I used to, I like clothes, you know, and I always collect yeah, the clothes yeah. and stuff. So, yeah, bro, that just kind of came to me, bro. And I just been riding and by the grace of God. Like, I've had some awesome support and awesome people to really get on a board. And it really helps with me doing full-time ministry right now. It definitely blesses to be able to travel and to be able to not even just travel, but to sow into other people and, Right. And to help other people and also, you know, give back to God as well. So when when you when you decided to do all this and how when people see you and they're like, oh, man, you just said you just trying to get rich off God. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I got to bring that topic again because that's a big old topic, especially amongst believers that have a gift as you. You know, you have a gift of your clothing line. I got a brother of mine, too, Strode. He got a clothing line also. But mm -hmm. when pe people don't see what how much it goes into that you know what i'm saying the only thing, the first thing that comes to their mind how oh, they're trying to get money off god because mm -hmm. they're slapping god on a t-shirt and they're gonna sell it you know what i'm saying yeah what what was your question what kind of so what kind of, how do you overcome those thoughts you know what i'm saying like when people sit mm -hmm. there and say oh johnny you're just doing this because everybody else is doing it bro because there's a market out here for it i mean to be honest like a i know I know I know the purpose of doing it and B, I know who who it all belongs to. Come on. And um I know who I'm living for and I know the purpose and the reasoning behind it. You know, I don't like I don't stray away from doing ministry and and, and, and advancing the kingdom and, and the gospel and 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 it's 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 a great way to not only 
acquire, but to give back and to, and to give back not only in um and allowing you to wear something that can represent God, but also right. allowing like um the gospel to be advanced. So I don't know. I just feel like it's a it's really like you got to hold yourself accountable and, and, and you got to be sensitive to the Holy spirit when the Holy spirit says, nah, this is not something you're ready for. You know what I'm saying? Like, or when the Holy spirit says, you know what, like, this is not what I called you to do. You just got to be obedient. You got to know, like, you know what, am I neglecting this? You know, am I, am I utilizing this for the wrong reason or am I giving God the glory? And am I, am I giving back to God? What is it? <clears throat> Sorry. I don't know why. I got to turn my throat. <clears> throat> But all right, so you already got your clothing line. You start. Was this before or after you started taking pictures? Um, no, I started taking pictures before. So your photography, yeah. you 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 were in the photography game before you were in the clothing. See, because I, I I've never gotten to meet you. I'm barely hearing your testimony. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's like it's mind blowing already on how you've already overcome the addiction and how when I first saw you and I I started following you on Instagram. I would have never told, I could have never tell you were a person that came from addiction. When you shared that story just recently, I think it was yesterday that you showed the pictures and how I just mm-hmm. rode through there. I was like, wow, bro. I would have never known that was who Johnny was before Christ. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So that in itself speaks volumes. And then yet you, you're, I've seen you at a few events and you're, you know what I'm saying? Doing your thing. I would have never told this, this guy was out here on benches. You know what I'm saying? Just, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, right. it's mind blowing bro to see. And especially how you interacted with the, with the homeless people on, on the, the 29th, you were out there, bro. There wasn't no fear in you. You know what I'm saying? Right. As far as I'm finna go out here and give these people the gospel because that's what I'm called to do. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And the love that I seen in person that you displayed to the homeless people it kind of was like, you know, there's there's certain people that you can tell that, oh, they're doing it for to be seen or they're doing it because, well, the Bible says so. now you got a genuine love for that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You could tell when it's heartfelt because mm-hmm. just of somebody who you were, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. coming to Christ, how hard was it for you? And you said it all happened in jail. But what I'm trying the the thing I'm trying to get to is the fact that you were blaming on you were blaming God for a lot of stuff you know what i'm saying when did when did it come to a point where you were already hurt because he you you blamed him for the for losing the girl you were already hurt on the fact that man he don't love me i'm out here you know what i'm saying so when did you feel that first encounter with christ of love you know what i'm saying that first love encounter with him so i didn't the first thing i felt was i felt the weight of my sin I felt the conviction of my lifestyle, not knowing that it was my sins. You know, I just thought it was just me being a junkie. I thought I was a junkie, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't built like this, but that's who I am, you know what I'm saying? Nasty. You know, it's just nasty. You just feel nasty, you know what I'm saying? Like It's like when you're low-key doing drugs and you're high around people, like people that know, like smoke weed or have pop pills, and you're high around, you know you're like, you are you feel out of place, you know? You feel right. better you feel like whatever. So when I first felt the weight of my sins and knew I couldn't carry them, I, I just so happened to reach out to a minister that was in the same streets that I was in doing ministry and testifying about their lifestyle. And they explained the Holy spirit and stuff. And I was like, that's what I'm feeling. Like I'm feeling that conviction, you know, I'm feeling like that, that, uh, that, that tugging on my spirit, but the love was really, really just how every time, that he saved me every time he was there for me, every time I cried out to him, every time I prayed to him, he heard me, you know what I'm saying? It's like, dang, like you gotta, you know what I'm saying? You gotta love something to, to, to hear something, even though it's so far from you. So I think it, it was a process, but mainly just, I really felt the love when not knowing him and wanting to build with him, he was there. Man, that's awesome. So when, when, when did, when you're out here in the world, right? You well, not in the world, but in the free. You no, know, I know what you mean. Yeah, how, yeah. How long? Did, how long did you have to 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 do before you when you gave your life to Christ in jail? Oh, I did. That? Um, I did like close to three months, and then I got out, and they had me because I was on probation, and I was bound to the state of Arizona. My mom had like restraining orders on me. She left me in the state of Arizona, like 
it was some big faith on her end. Like it's a whole amazing, powerful testimony. I, I think a lot of I think a lot of mothers and stuff like that would look. She was actually in Houston at the outreach going hard. Like it was super awesome to have her out here serving and and, and uh, um coming alongside. Her her testimony is amazing, right? So so from that, like um coming from all that, like it was just like like you know, um I forgot what I was, what was the what was the question? Just how the first encounter of love that, that God had gave you when you said you felt the weight, but I, I was asking how long you had did because I wanted to oh. know when you, when you touched down after mm. you didn't got no more you have no state uh, restrictions. You got no, it's just Johnny. You out, now it's just you, you and God, you know what I'm saying? You're out there. Mm -hmm. Have you ever come to any obstacles in your life where it's, man, it's right. You could taste it. You know what I'm saying? As an mm -hmm. addict myself, I could tell you, I go through as a former addict. Let me mm -hmm. get the word right. Cause that will yeah. hold me to that. Uh, when I go through some certain seasons or certain times, it's like, man, if I could just take a bump, bro, just one yeah. bump, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and get rid of all this. But mm -hmm. I can, I go to the point of I can taste it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It'd be in, mm -hmm. I feel that drip, and mm -hmm. I gotta get into a prayer. I get. How did you overcome that? Touching down, you so, know what I'm saying? So it was, it was, it was through a couple of things: prayer, praise, worship, the Word of God. When, no matter what you're doing, you could be doing one of these things, but you gotta occupy your mind because if the the enemy can have your mind. You can have your actions that follow and that lead. So you got to occupy your mind and keep your mindset on things above, not of this world, not of this earth. And it's a, like you said, spiritual warfare. It's, it's a warfare of battle every single day. You got to put on the whole armor of God. You got to sling the sword of the spirit. You got to know how to use it against the enemy. Because if you look at Jesus and the God, and um, when he was in the wilderness, Satan used the word and twisted it. Come on. But what God, what Jesus did was he stood on the word of God. Like he knew it. And if you, a lot of Christians will become casualties because they're so comfortable and not wanting to know the word of God. Because when you know the word of God, you won't get misconstrued, led astray or deceived by the lies of the enemy, you know, and the temptations of the enemy. You, you know, when you get that temptation, when you get that feeling, you'll know, no, like no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm more than a conqueror. You know what I'm saying? By his stripes, I'm healed. I don't walk according to the flesh, but I walk according to the spirit. All these things you can, that's word, that's scripture. You speak that into your life. You you, mm. you give yourself that like, you know what I'm saying? That self um, realization of, you know, this is the word of God. And I'm standing on it. This is my identity. I'm a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people. I'm the head and not the tail above and not beneath. You know, you got to know this word of God to allow yourself to be shifted from carnal and fleshly to actually spiritual, Man. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That, that's good, bro, because a lot of people that walk out here, they they don't know their weaponry. They don't know what they can and can't do. There's a yep. season that, that my wife is going through in life, and, man, the way she speaks to that situation, bro, it's like, man, I find strength in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, bro, you there's, there's a situation to where you can only choose Jesus. Yeah. You know, many people crawl in a corner and and will fold up. Me at the beginning of this season, I had to, I needed my brothers around me because I'm like, man, I'm gonna do it. I'm boohooing, and yeah. she looking at me like, bro, you tripping? You know what I'm saying? So not knowing your weaponry, bro, is big. Is is super, mm -hmm. super, super ne necessary to know. Mm -hmm. Especially like you said, the word of God. Ultimately, that's what's gonna, that's what you fight with. But what would you say? to a person that may be struggling with addiction that can't come out of it, that don't have that family behind them, don't have somebody chasing them, but they know they want different. They know that what they're doing isn't right, but it's their only escape. You know what I'm saying? Some know Jesus, some don't know Jesus, but that yeah. is their God. That's the way they escape their misery, their pain, their frustration, because they maybe can't put food on the table. So they escape the reality of not being able mm -hmm. to do this father that they need to be not being able to be this man that they need to be for their significant other what kind of encouragement would you give to them if they're struggling right now ready to come out of it but don't know how to i would say build a relationship with god even where you're at let's say like there's a kid in a family and it's the bad kid the black sheep but the father just has this love right there's nothing that that 
that that black sheep can really do that they can't talk to their father they don't have to talk about what they're doing right which you should with god but you know you can still talk to 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 your father and build and be that son to your father and i think that's what happened with me like i would talk to god a lot like and i would ask him to help me i would cry be getting high and still asking him to help me and i would never stop that relationship and pursuing that relationship and like a wanting that change you never saw the devil would lie to you and say oh and like god's not going to hear you if you're struggling with this um addiction and all this stuff not that he will he won't hear you he won't hear you he may not answer the prayers that you want the way you want them but he's still listening to your heart's cry because he wants that posture of receiving from your heart he wants the heart to say you know what i'm not gonna hide this from you i'm gonna open up my life and open up my heart so that you can come and search my heart and whatever that looks like I think you should never stray away, even if you're using to this day, never stray away from asking the father to take these things from you, declaring that he would heal you, declaring that he would set you free by faith, even as you're getting high. Obviously, God doesn't want you to get high, but if you know you're struggling with it and you're, you're giving in, you got to reach out to the Lord, surrender to his will, repent, turn from it. You know, acknowledge your sin to God because, you know, God can't address what you can't confess. And he wants you to yeah, constantly be confessing true. these things. God can't address what you can't confess. Yeah, right there. And as you're confessing these areas of your life, he's going to want to take them from you. And you got to be prepared to surrender them. So it's an order. It's an order of like, you know, building with God. But more importantly, surrendering, repenting and trusting in the Holy Spirit. You know what I'm saying? And acknowledging your sin. It's really important. And how important was discipleship to you, bro? How important was it for you to plug into somebody, a body of believers? Bro? Boy, that, you know it, what I'm it's saying? Important, it's important you to plug in somebody. Even if it's not a body right now, which it should be a body of believers, don't forsake the assembly of the saints. But it's important to have somebody above you that's, that you allow to speak into your life, that you trust their godly counsel. Come on. You know, it says in the abundance of counsel, there is safety in the Proverbs. And I think it's super important that we allow ourselves to, A, be spoken into, corrected, discipled, and poured into by a brother that is going to tell us the truth. And there's people out there that really want to be, like, they, they really are open to hold you accountable. You just got to want to be held accountable. Come on, man. And how easy was it for you to be open to, to discipleship or to accountability? Let's just use accountability as that word. How easy was it for you to be accountable to people knowing, you know, because there's a lot of people that struggle with, <laughs> there's a lot of people that struggle with uh, the shame and guilt of what they've come out of. So they don't mm -hmm. really share with people what they've been through after, the, after Jesus delivers them from it. You know what I'm saying? But me, I'm a firm believer of, of Revelations 12, 11, bro. We're overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, paraphrasing. But without that word of the testimony, how can people be able to, to say, man, Jesus did it for him. He could do it for me too. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. we might be the only Jesus somebody sees. We might mm -hmm. be the only Bible somebody reads. They, they, know yeah. we, they know us as believers and be like, man, how can he be at peace in the midst of this storm? I know what he's going through personally because people are going to talk and run their mouth. You know what I'm saying? That's just the way of the world. So when they see that they've already, they've already caught wind of what you're going through and they can still see that you're at peace with it. You know what I'm saying? So they want that too. But for the people that are still holding that guilt and shame and not being able to release their testimony, what kind of encouragement can you give to them to be accountable for what they've done? You know what I'm saying? To somebody. I mean just don't don't hide anything from god or others and be honest be transparent allow there to be areas of your life where you are saying you know what i don't have it all together i do need growth i do need this area to change you know allow i pray that god helps you to see the areas that he wants to take from you and more importantly like humble yourself you know because you don't have it all together especially new believers old believers whatever it is like you got to understand that there's areas in your life that God wants to transform and renew and refine because, you know, God is a holy God and he's looking for a, a clean temple to house himself in because at the end of the day, no holy thing can be dwelling in unclean places. So, you know, he wants, he wants to fill you. He wants to seal you, but you got to allow, you know, and trust that the Holy Spirit can correct, redirect and, um, and sharpen you.
and that sometimes is through people, you know, holding you accountable and allowing you to to see the areas that you need to take to the next step. And with you, with you saying that, bro, how hard was it for you to get your first no as a believer, as a person that you that holds accountable? Had, the well, person you know, that holds accountable. correction, correction, correction isn't easy for nobody, right? But okay. when I was locked, when I got locked up, you know, I, I had my conversion in, in jail. The only outlet I had was my mom, and she was pouring into me. And real early, she would check me on my language pride so right like she would always be like no god gets all the glory it's not you doing this she'd always be like don't talk like that you know you know what i'm saying you're you know you're you're not representing christ when you talk a certain way like so like it's kind of it's a little easier a little coming from a parent it doesn't really matter but that uh, that always set the pace for allowing me it was, it was like an, a year advancement in in the spirit because she already had a year under her belt learning all this and she was just pouring on to me so that was just my case, and it was definitely a blessing. But I mean, at the end of the day, it's really a hard posture of knowing like we don't got it all figured out. And once you can, once you can admit that you need help in every area of life, you allow you truly want a desire for people to speak into it. Man, that's good, bro. So where where can these people where can people find your clothing line at, bro? If they want to go look and sow a seed into your ministry. Yeah, um, you can find me on my Instagram is Believe and Repent. And in my bio, it has my um, clothing brand is Redeemed Supply, you know. And also in my bio is my um, my business of photography and videography and stuff. So, y'all can definitely connect with me at Believe and Repent on Instagram. That has everything through there. And you know, what I'm saying you can reach out Johnny Martinez on Facebook. It's a little harder. There's a lot of Johnny Martinez. <laughs> so how long how long have you been doing pictures, bro? Like how the photo side of things was that. Well, I've been doing that for like for like three years, but I've been I've been taking pictures. I used to take pictures of the sunset with my phone and little stuff. I used to graffiti and stuff, so I used to take pictures of that. But you know, I went to Miami Dade College and got certified in programs and stuff. So like, I take that very serious. You know, I, I do consider myself professional. You know, I shoot weddings, businesses, barbershops, all kinds of stuff, lash balls, everything you can think of, events. You know, so it's definitely a blessing. Come on, man. So y'all get with them on on the uh, on the photography, and that boy's a professional right there, man. You got some. You got who took the picture you sent me? You did? Oh no! Well, that was my camera, yeah. But my boy Bryant Orozco from um LA, KMF Los Angeles. Salute. That's my brother. Yeah, he, he be on he be on the road with us a lot. He knows how to wield the camera, and not many do. Man, and that that's a, that's an awesome picture. And one question from myself, bro, how can you get those awesome pictures when everybody's always moving around? Because well, I try and take pictures of my pastor when he's up there trying to do give words, and I always catch like foul pictures of him. How can you well, catch some perfect pictures, man? Well, if you if it's really understanding the camera, you you put a higher shutter speed when they're going faster so you can catch them and slow them down. So it's really understanding a camera. I mean, I use a really good camera. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you got to understand how to use it, yeah. But, man, I appreciate your time, Johnny. Man, thank you for coming on. You got an awesome testimony, bro. And, man, you encourage a lot of people, bro, especially your walk. I would have not known after doing a little research on you and seeing who you were and where you came from. I was amazed, bro, on on what you've been through and where you're at now. You you really don't wear it, bro. And you also walk with this boldness like that ain't me. So, you know, I'm I'm able to talk about it because I know that's not who I am. You Mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So... I thank you for coming on. Thank you, Facebook, for tuning in. And if mm-hmm. you feel like you you are that one that has that addiction, bro, or you feel like you need help somewhere, man, you can reach out to Johnny. You can reach out to myself. We can find you somebody to get you plugged into, especially out here in the Fort County area. We went to Glory Church International, welcomed you with open arms. And if you're in mm-hmm. Houston and you have issues, we got a lot of churches we can plug you into. And if you're out there in, in Miami and yep. any surrounding areas, he's worldwide. He knows <laughs> any place he can get you plugged in. Yeah, so I get you in. Plug, uh, we'll be able to plug, reach out and we're going to get you plugged in. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for tuning in.